Okay, so I'm going to, uh, well, like you said, talk about collaborative video on Wikipedia. Uh, I've been working, well, uh, I started the MetaVid project as a thesis project uh, two or three years ago now. And then, uh, but for the last uh, six months, I've been working on sort of uh, bringing or generalizing that work for uh, use within uh, Wikimedia and working at the San Francisco office of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, so, but first, let's uh, do a quick overview. First, I'll go over why open media is important, uh, particular f particularly for Wikimedia, and uh, the the reasoning behind going with open media. Uh, obviously, it's not. It would have been a lot easier if they just started throwing Flash up on on the site. But there's some some reasons for uh, making that alternate choice, uh, and then all, so and then the, that alternate choice presents a lot of challenges, um, and sort of look at how the community is uh, addressing them. And uh, then we'll do a little technology overview of, of MetaVid uh, Wiki project and how that will make its way into Wikipedia or sort of the target feature set. But of course, it's going to evolve with community uh, input and participation as to what actually happens there. And then some, some walkthrough, I'll demo some of the tech. So why is open media important? Um, we it's sort of a lot. It's going to put uh, make video a lot more like images and text are today. So it, it makes uh, uh, you don't you don't hear a lot of about uh, DRM schemes for text or images or and you don't uh, and you don't have free software having trouble playing back a JPEG um, and you don't. Uh, and it's a lot easier to post an image to your blog than, uh, and host that image yourself than it is to post a video to that blog and host that video yourself. So uh, open media uh, lets you address a lot of those problems. Uh, and, and the baseline reason is essentially free, pa free platforms can be first class media citizens with playback and creation with patent unencumbered formats. It's just not really possible in the patented media space, as uh, some of you may be aware or have looked into. Uh, so, but what are all these challenges to wider adoption? Well, first of all, there's a huge content base of proprietary um, patent encumbered media out there, and we can't just you know pretend all that media doesn't exist. Um, there's proprietary media frameworks like QuickTime and Direct Show, which are not free format friendly. We have BSD licensed uh, components for both those frameworks, but it's not like they're going to start shipping those tomorrow, uh, even if, even if they're you know, completely as free as possible <laughs> for them to ship. Uh, hardware, <coughs> and then you have the problem of hardware manufacturers are uh, shipping chips that are um, you know, hard coded to particular proprietary media formats. And that's that's also another big challenge. Like you're not going to be able to uh, view Wikipedia content on your iPhone, for example, without hit, incurring a big performance hit for software in software decoding. If the software was if the platform was unlocked to begin with, which is another problem. Um, and then even more challenges is <laughs> there's very few uh, quality free software tools for creating content. So all these all the tools are in, in themselves uh, supported by the companies that are promoting the, the closed formats. So of course, Adobe uh, authoring tools are not, or sorry, yeah, Adobe authoring tools aren't going to export to uh, open media formats because they are, you know, the ones benefiting from the entrenched proprietary media format. Um, and so even, so free, so and then even, well, I, I went backwards there, but free software tools can't uh, export to proprietary media media formats without uh, running into patent issues, so there's so there's an, a double problem, um, and but then so then we run into the the final sort of question here is why why push forward with these free formats if a people can't view them and b people can't create them, so it is you know we're sort of uh, pushing out this this uh, ideology is that more important than the accessibility for the majority of people, and of course no it's not we need free software projects that do support playing and creating 
uh, patent and covered formats are incredibly important, need to be supported, and uh, of course they're not legally distributed, distributable, but we'll just have to uh, pretend that doesn't exist and make it as easy as possible for people to uh, download those uh, proprietary systems from there from within their Ubuntu. I mean, if you've, see, if you've seen the latest versions of Ubuntu or anything, you can sort of get a feel for how, how it's very like one click away from importing every free software package to decode all the proprietary stuff. But um, ultimately, we believe we can overcome these challenges. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how that's happening. Oh, it's really, can you guys read that very well? It's kind of dark. Well, oh well. <coughs> so, Overcoming challenges. The ver I mean, the big the big problem is uh, adoption, right? So we need to get lots of content out there. Uh, recently, archive.org just transcoded their entire archive into free formats, which Wikimedia was involved in uh, helping push helping them push that along. Um, uh, and Wikimedia itself, of course, is uh, the f a f fourth largest website nowadays, and it's purely. Uh, do you have a quick question? The new, uh, we'll have a little, I'll mention that later, but yeah, they, they use the, the current Theora encoder, which, yeah, is not, but there is no, the, the new encoder is not ready for uh, uh, large-scale use, which um, I'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, and... Well, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Archive.org has the original MPEG-2s and uh, DV files that people upload, so, and it didn't take them that long. They have a cluster of 2,200 nodes or so, or machines, so they're able to transcode the entire thing over the course of a few weeks, so it won't be a big deal. We'll just, uh, once the new encoder comes out, we'll just rederive. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Like what did I get last year? Okay, okay, and then um, so and then the, the the another challenge is so you want to let people uh, so they've created their movie in in Final Cut and now how do you um, get them to convert it to AUG? What we've uh, been working on a cool tool called Firefog that uh, does in-browser transcoding and uploading. So the end user just goes straight from their uh, DV file to to the website, and we avoid the um, videos looking crappy like on YouTube because we don't have to uh, re-derive from a, uh, some arbitrary uh, transition format that people upload because people can't upload their 14 gigabyte raw DV file to YouTube. Uh, but in this case, we'll be going directly from their DV file to what we'll be distributing on the site. Um, there's lack of player support. That's that's sort of addressed today. If you view content on Wikipedia, you, I think we have a pretty good high hit rate for people uh, being able to at least view the content with the with the array of uh, fallback plugins that we hit. Um, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about MV Embed shortly. And then what I mentioned earlier, the proprietary frameworks, of course, don't want to support. Um, the putting our codecs into them, but it's not as important as we shift towards the, the web platform. And uh, you notice that it wasn't a big deal that QuickTime and Direct Show did not support FLV. It just uh, was able to push out adoption really quickly because the web platform is able to sort of shift that um, media production landscape. Um, um, yeah, mobile devices, of course, still a challenge. Uh, so the situation is improving with open source video editors, and again, the platform is the web, so we'll, we'll see in-browser video editors sort of dominating the casual uh, video content creation market uh, very soon, I think. And, um, and because, because of that, it will sort of need interoperable formats, and because free formats are, by their nature, easy to re-implement in other places without having to pay any uh, licensing costs or have, having to reverse engineer somebody else's technology, you can uh, you can imagine that, or we're going in the direction that it'll be easy for open source desktop apps to interoperably work with the um, web services that are based on the free formats, sort of enabled by um, 
server-side tools for doing those segmentations, serving up little pieces of video, and, and then also uh, sending them back. So on to Wikipedia. So why, why are open media formats important for Wikipedia? Well, if we look at their mantra, we can say, you know, uh, every single human being freely share in the sum of human knowledge. We can more freely share in knowledge with free formats. So obviously, if people have to buy software to uh, view or communicate uh, between each other, then that's uh, a less, that's a more expensive cost than uh, a free format where the tools to view and uh, communicate with that media are free. So free formats for free content. Um, we go, so now I'm going to go into the technology overview of what we're aiming to put on there. So it, it features um, logical groupings for temporal streams that basically, I'll, I'll jump in, actually this is sort of an overview, I'll jump into each of these in a second. Um, transcript, subtitles, annotations, categorizations, um, uh, a library for uh, uh, supporting whatever system the browser comes, and so the browser, the, the client comes to the web page with this particular browser, maybe it's uh, IE with Java, and then it's able to choose the right player for it. Uh, and then the collaborative video sequencing software that's also under development for allowing people to edit clips and things. Uh, so, so here's sort of the, the logical grouping of media that we're basically proposing. It's kind of hard to read, I guess, but um, basically it lets you group together high quality and low quality versions of the file so that um, if you want to like go back later and uh, rederive it or if you have a high bandwidth environment, you can watch the high quality version versus the low quality version, but they all, they're all associated with the same uh, name in the wiki, so, or the same resource title in the wiki, so you're able to uh, jump between the different formats. Likewise, the um, time, multiple time text layers can be associated with that same uh, name, uh, along with uh, multiple audio streams. The, the idea being that uh, you have a single resource name to sort of encapsulate all the timed media that is uh, the same. So if it's uh, time text or uh, an audio track with you, the same at, at three minutes, you're going to have the same uh, content. You want to pull up the same thing, essentially. So all the time, time data tracks in the same grouping, and it and it it's analogous to uh, uh, row rich open multi-track media encapsulation, which is sort of an XML format for describing that resource. Um, if we have more time, I'll go into more details about how that XML looks and what it aims to accomplish. Um, and part of, part of that stream resource name is that you pull into a, a transcript editor so people can collaborate on creating those transcripts and it gets associated with that stream namespace. Uh, and you can write, it does, it's, it's not multilingual supported yet, but it's one of the goals. Um, you can sort of, the basic workflow is you sort of preview the video, set the in and out points, edit, um, and save. I'll, I'll hopefully demo that shortly. And it, it exports into an uh, interchangeable XML format. And it would be pretty easy to write converters for other time text formats. And so, yeah, so you have that row XML, but what do you do with it? You send it to this JavaScript library that's able to uh, interpret that row XML and say, oh, that my, my client has, uh, um, is localized for this language, so I'm going to send this, this language transcript to them. Or my client is, uh, you know, supports, uh, has lots of bandwidth, so it's able to send that to them. And it's able to map it. So my client has the um, VLC plugin. I'm going to play, I'm going to play back the video with VLC instead of Java or make those choices. And, but then all those um, uh, playback systems get sort of mapped into a single abstraction so that uh, the application, though, so like the uh, transcript editor, for example, doesn't, doesn't have to worry about what underlying plugin systems it's using. It just uh, targets the HTML5-ish uh, spec. Uh, it also does a few other things like, um, well, or here's a sample, sample usage 
it's very simple. Once the once the script's included, you can just use the video tag in your website, even if you're even if the browser that comes to visit visit your website doesn't support the HTML5 video tag, it gets rewritten to whatever they do support for playback. <coughs> and so here's some of the, the plugin targets. You know, so there's a lot of ways to playback video uh, in the browser, and it sort of tries to hit on all those. And it, it and in the context, it also has a fallback to it's like supports multiple codecs for Wikimedia. That's not necessarily too important because um, they'll just be doing Theora at first. But in the future, maybe they'll have Dirac, and they'll need to detect, uh, you know, player support for that. And then, so essentially, but also it also has a fallback for Flash plugin on its current incarnation. It doesn't. It so you so it, what I mentioned. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but uh, the 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 row the row format lets you um, lets you set lots of. Oops, here it is. Multiple uh, multiple versions of the video. So you both have your high quality version, your low quality version, your flash encoded version, your Theora version encoded version, your Dirac encoded version. But the, all those videos are the same video. Right. Yeah, but it, but they could but they could use the facility of it. Uh, it's sort of a stream selection process, um, so it could potentially use it once they support other formats, or if they have multiple quality. So if they have a high quality version and a low quality version, you could allow the end user to select the high quality version if they had enough bandwidth, similar to what they do on YouTube by choosing H.264 or something. <coughs> and it also in VMBed, the library also provides for remote embedding. Uh, and, it, and that row XML follows it along, so you can still, uh, once it's remote, once it's embedded in some blog or something, you can still pull up the the time text associated with your clip that you've included. I'll demo that too. Um, also has a seeking system, so for JPEG serving. So like if you're if you're scrolling through the the scroll bar, it can serve up a JPEG if your plugin doesn't support local seeking. Okay. And and that's also useful for the video editor component, so it can just pull uh, frames uh, from a given time, and that's sort of abstracted from the the uh, the underlying plugin system, so that you can uh, have your video editor and uh, be scrolling back and forth on it, and then you get frame updates even if the even if your underlying plugin system did not support serving uh, arbitrary frames from the the video file, or if you hadn't loaded it yet. Like what? Right. So, so yeah, the the time, the time. So his question was, could you, uh, in, you know, inc include other metadata? And the answer is, yeah, the timed. The timed metadata that you're uh, editing is arbitrary, so it's it's like as open as a wiki. So if you geotagged your your um, like in the same way that you geotag any wiki page today, you could geotag a a, a a temporal segment of the video, and that would apply to that uh, piece of the video or the entire video if you wanted to tag the entire video as such. But so then so then when you're playing back the video, you would be able to programmatically access that um, that geocoded data. Okay, so we have uh, this rich library for embedding media, and we also we need to look at the problem of finding media. And to do that, we I'm working on a um, add media wizard, which is uh, uh, it's kind of a complicated diagram. So I'll try to explain it. It both it both serves. So within the sequencer, you need to be able to locate uh, resources to add into your um, sequence. So we need to be able to search. Uh, uh, repositories, uh, Commons, for example, because that's Wikimedia's hosted uh, image repository. But it, it, there's no reason why we can't add in other repositories like Metavid, Archive.org, Flickr, um, arbitrary networks that provide um, either images or uh, video with um, licensing data and uh, can be searched remotely. So it, it's a generalized library, so each of those uh, new repositories just become another object, and you just sort of 
can add it. It'll be easy to add in lots of remote repositories. Uh, and it's also, and since it's, the output is not, uh, is also abstracted, so you can, it, it can both output to a wiki page or to a sequence, so you can sort of use it as an add media wizard to, uh, it, to send clips to a page, or you can use it to send clips to your sequence. And it's not um, tied to the uh, underlying wiki, so you can also use this same add media wizard uh, on, on your wiki too. So that's what all these little double lines situation is over here. So, you, so it's both, um, it's just sort of a shared library for injecting media from shared repositories. Uh, and it also, I don't have it showed here, but you can also, uh, it also integrates the um, uploading system. And that'll, uh, once the upload API for uh, MediaWiki lands, which we're working on, you should be able to, <coughs> from the same and media wizard interface, uh, transcode within the browser and upload right into the, right into the wiki page that you're on, or transcode and insert right into the sequence that you're editing, or uh, transcode and insert into the wiki that you're working on at some other website. <coughs> and so, e and then that, that yeah. It's not sure yet, but you can already add it as a user script. So you can already, I already use it for injecting images now. And I use it for injecting uh, video too, and I'll, I'll demo that in a, in a moment. Um, and it also includes uh, libraries for uh, modifying that media. So you find this resource, and maybe you want to uh, crop just to, the, to a certain section or maybe you want to scale the image, or maybe you want to control the layout or position of it. That's all in the same uh, library. So you can uh, set, the, set the crop points for a given image. Or if you're dealing with uh, video, if you found a video resource, it'll let you set the in and out points for that video resource. And then you inject that, just that segment. This is particularly useful if you're dealing with content like Metavid is, where it's, you know, nine hour streams, you want to just find the particular speech that somebody says, and you just want to inject that um, 30 seconds or so, it uh, uh, lets you, right, right from that ad media wizard, it lets you select the in and out points and plop it right into the, the wiki. So now I'm moving on to the, the video editor. OK. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, so it can upload content to using the MediaWiki API. Is it sequencing of a, of a video from it's, it's all integrated. So yes, you can, se you can sequence from, well, well, yeah, once you, uh, I didn't show this slide, but once you, uh, it automat it knows which wikis it's on, so it, it can be configured so it says, oh, I'm on uh, Wikimedia, I don't need to import comments, I can just reference it directly. I'm on uh, mywiki.com, I need to import that comments asset uh, before I can use it uh, on my wiki. Or I'm on uh, Wikipedia and I've found a Metavid clip, I need to import that asset before I can use it. So it knows, it knows to check which context it's in and uh, import or, um, yeah, yeah, depending on its context. <coughs> um, so the, the target, the, the, the goals for the collaborative video sequencer is uh, basic editing, uh, some limited effects, and some you know, transitions, simple things, sort of letting people string together a series of images, um, do simple overlays, uh, and with uh, wiki-driven templates, which means the uh, template variables are um, stored within the sequence, so you can, you can call uh, a template. Here, I'll just show the next slide because it explains it better. Oh, but one more thing is the API for desktop editors, so it'll also uh, work integrate with um, desktop editors that want to uh, collaborate on the video sequence. Uh, it will be a shared format, so they can import that uh, sequence, make some edits, and save it out to the to the wiki because this is all happening on the API level. So it's not you don't need to load the wiki page if if. Uh, you don't need to. So, say for example, so some some effects will be difficult to achieve performance 
uh, in the wiki. So like doing some filter, for example, that'll probably be done on desktop, desktop video editors. And then uh, once it, the filter gets applied, it uh, gets, you know, it'll be flattened, flattened for the server. Um, and that's using a PT, like a G streamer based, uh, well, this is not obviously not done yet or anywhere near done or, but, <laughs> but the idea is to plan for that approach so that it'll be a interchange sequence format that can be uh, flattened out. Right. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. So here's the screenshot of the GUI. I'll hopefully demo it in a second. Uh, here's the XML. And you can see, so here's a t we're, here we're pulling in a template resource. And that, and then we're passing it. Oh, the video title is my fish. The, and then the date is 1952. That's just sort of like you, you set up this template as, a, as a, your title frame, for example. Or maybe it's just a title overlay. Um, and then that way you can sort of uh, create consistent, a, lot, a big part of Wikipedia is sort of uh, creating consistency around content so that a lot of editorialization is, uh, you know, making it look and flow the, uh, in a similar way. And a good way to accomplish that is with the use of templates. So we'll, we'll try to bring that uh, metaphor into the collaborative video environment. Uh, and then you see the, see the stream reference down here. And then again, it's pulling in the, the stream so it's able to, it's able to uh, when playing back in the browser, it grabs the low quality AUG, but later on, if it's going to flatten it, it's going to grab the, you know, the high quality Dirac version or the original MPEG-2 if it's referenced. You know, so it'll, it'll be able to, you, by moving things over to a uh, logical grouping in the stream namespace, you're able to do that. Or, or maybe you flatten it out to a different language or, and, and or <laughs> you play it back and then you want to be able to select your subtitle track. Th those can pull from the underlying assets. You don't need to re-subtitle re, uh, any sequence that you're working on. Uh, you just uh, subtitle the underlying assets. So then you don't, so it saves a lot of work that way. And then, so this is the, what it out outputs to. It's a lot more verbose. It'll um, resolve all the stream uh, content, it'll resolve all the templates, it'll resolve, uh, if you do sequence uh, transclusion, it'll resolve all that out, output it to a format that's um, handleable by the, that self-contained format. So it doesn't need to know, doesn't need to do a bunch of API calls to read derive the, the format that it's playing back. Okay. Now, we will show you some of the stuff in action. So here's, uh, the transcript editing. Uh, this is a speech by Obama on the on the bailout. You notice we have we have both uh, annotative layers. I think it's a little harder to well. You can see it's gray. The annotative layers are gray. Uh, you can sort of add in um, categories. Uh, you can add in uh, bill bill IDs and this. And these are all sort of auto auto completed based on the so it knows a bill it has to look in the bill category it knows a person has to look in the person category um, how that'll map out into Wikipedia is still open but but the basic concept is you have sort of GUIs for sort of structuring the data and those are sort of uh, driven by templates um, and then you can sort of save changes and then you get your updated so now you have and these categories create uh, uh, lists of video that are of that are about the bailout, um, but just the time segments of those videos that are about the bailout. The person debating that bailout, the person uh, talking about it. So you're able to categorize uh, sections of video, and that becomes and and because it's not just it's not <clears throat> it's not just categories. It's it's open tagging. You can do things like um, uh, semantic queries. So like uh, show me clips of Republican female Congress people with more than $1 million total contributions that are presently in office. So you can, it's a, it, it brings a semantic uh, query system into uh, temporal media. <clears throat> and, those be, and those become RSS feeds and uh, could be, you know, dynamically dealt with in other ways because they have programmatic output. Uh, and 
This one was find me um, interest. Oh, so this is for uh, over a million dollars from contribution cont of contributions from attorney and law firms, and th and there'll sort of be a GUI for making these selections. So like, you get, do the date range, and you get sort of um, date range GUI. You do the um, the spoken by, and you get spoken by GUI. So you, it's sort of, uh, it'll, you build these queries uh, with a visual interface. You wouldn't want to be writing semantic queries by hand. That'd be no fun. <clears throat> and then, yeah, so the, that uh, text editing we were doing, I didn't really show that part, but uh, how, how are we for time? What's the, does, oh well. Um, okay, cool. So. Hmm. Yes. So I am running the nightly builds of Firefox, which isn't always super stable. OK. <clears throat> uh, da, da, da. We'll load again. Um, but basically, yeah, you can also set the, you can edit the transcripts, set the in and out points, and uh, preview the video and make sure that the video matches the transcript, and then from there you just sort of save it, and then as this is done in aggregate and crowdsourced, you get high quality transcript material. In the context of uh, Metavid, we have a closed caption feed uh, that provides a certain level of accuracy. Uh, in the context of arbitrary video, you could use uh, speech to uh, text system, but again, those none of those are 100% accurate. So you want to be able to crowdsource it, and uh, not to mention the uh, annotations and categories that are, uh, of course, user generated and have user semantic meaning. Which, of course, yeah, I mean you can't programmatically generate. So, um, so you see, let's see little options here. You see here. It exposes sort of the row um, features. So here we're able to download the files that the that, that stream uh, encapsulates, like the web streamable, the flash version, or the high quality version. And we're also able to grab a little bit of embed code to embed it into our blog. So you can see it embedded on a blog here. Um, Takes a while to load over the wireless. Oh, there we go. Okay, and once and the important thing is all that metadata follows it along. So you can pull up your transcripts right here, and uh, you can jump to a particular part of the transcript that's uh, you're looking for. And this and that's just a consequence of the of the row format. We can play it if we want, but so. And then as it plays, it'll um, update the, it'll scroll the transcript on the right. Once it, there it goes, scrolls along. Um, okay. Um, okay, so let's look at the Add Media Wizard real quick. We can, we can look at it, we'll look at it uh, locally first, and then I'll show you it on Wikipedia to show how it handles a uh, different context. So here we're in the uh, editing article on the local host, and so this is just a bunch of uh, text. We highlight a word, it knows to search for that word, it pulls up a bunch of things from comments, it can pull up the next 30 results, there's a lot of photos of the piece thing, we find what image that we like, Zooms in, downloads a high-resolution version. We can decide if we want to crop a section. We can preview the insert into a page. And now it knows that, oh, I don't have that resource locally. It's going to try to grab it from, it's going to grab it, copy it over to the local wiki. Uh, we can say, do import resource. It goes ahead and downloads that asset from commons. Uh, and then you can, oops. doesn't always work. Uh, Oh, it did work. It just didn't know it worked. Uh, <laughs> um, so now we're yeah. So now we're previewing that asset, and we can do insert, and it gives us the wiki text to insert that image into our text. And because we did a crop, it needs to have a little extra, a little extra wiki text. If uh, if we had just done a normal, a normal insert, 
it would know to say if we just did a normal insert, insert into page, it just copies that image directly because we didn't do any crop uh, cropping. Uh, and you notice when, uh, okay. So then we can also use it on Wikipedia. And again, this doesn't, it's because it's, uh, it's a very high level, it's really easy to install onto any wiki. You don't have to actually ask permission for them to install it. By the nature of MediaWiki, it gives you a user space JavaScript, which allows you to install this whole library without actually touching any of the code of the particular wiki that you're using the wizard on. Um, so you can just click on Add Media, Add Media Wizard here we're on Wikipedia, and it's importing the Add Media Wizard from another uh, server, and we get the same same thing. Now it doesn't need to import the assets because it knows it's on Wikipedia. If we just uh, click this picture of a sandbox, insert into the page, we get our little sandbox right here. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. But yeah, so now we get the sandbox right there. And if we wanted to do, you know, if we wanted to do crops or manipulations, it would know to do that. Likewise, if we, if we pull in from, I don't know if I'll get a lot of hits of Congress people mentioning sandbox, but um, if we pull in from MetaVid, it knows to it knows that we can set in and out points of the video because that's the nature of the MetaVid sites is running Oxy Chop, which Conrad will be talking about later. Um, so that we can you know set the in and out points, preview the clip, and then insert it into the wiki. Although it's waiting on one little patch to land to MediaWiki, was just enabling remote injection, but or enabling re remote file uploads, which should land shortly. Um, but then it'll be applicable to all wikis that have uh, enable upload by URL. <coughs> so we can go back to cancel that. Okay, so now we will look at the sequencer. So the way that the sequencer works, it, it builds on this uh, concept of HTML5 which uh, lets you do things like overlay, uh, do, basically apply CSS attributes to video and to uh, HTML on top of video. So it's very easy to uh, plop your uh, div on top of the video and sort of, so like if you wanted to do a fade from black, what you do is you, you plop a black div on top and uh, fade it out over time uh, and then you get a simple effect. You can show this in working here. This is a smile file that it's reading from and then it plays it so it knows to uh, fade from green and then it'll uh, cross dissolve into uh, another clip in a second here. Uh, there it is. It's kind of maybe hard to see there but it's switching into the uh, eclipse animation and then it cross dissolves and done with the end. Correct. And then so this all becomes the platform for collaboratively editing sequences. Of course, it won't be vi visible for people that don't have HTML5 browsers, but what we'll do in such cases is just flatten out the video or, and or encourage people to download Firefox. <coughs> so here's... Yeah. Yeah, so you, you get you get a lot of a lot a lot of control over the video with HTML5. You can you can pull the time stamp from it and control you know its position in the stream, and you can do lots of things that uh, just be very easy to do. Uh, the nice thing about it over the current Flash environment is that you can uh, bring it into your your system and start you know plopping things on top. Like you can it just deals with HTML and JavaScript much better, of course, than uh, a Flash platform-based solution. <coughs> So here we're in the editor. You can, do, of course, do things like move clips around. Um, it has uh, keyboard shortcuts, so you can, you know, just press the delete key like a normal GUI application, and it deletes the clips. It, it also uh, supports sort of copying and pasting uh, with the control keys with bindings. You can you can edit the resource. So here, this one's a particularly interesting one. We'll look. This is a template that's part of the sequence. If we uh, edit the selected resource, it provides us with the template parameters as uh, editable fields, so we can just edit those. Don't have, it's still in development, of course, so there's not like a quick button to preview it or save it right now, but, but uh, basically it is reading those attributes from the 
Smile XML, it knows to make that uh, option available. Uh, this, this will be translated into more complicated situations where, say, uh, you're collaborating on a long sequence and you have, like, it's made of four sequence parts. Each person would, uh, you know, or each group of people would work on a small sequence together and then you could uh, string them all together as a final product or as a maybe more applicable for the wiki news context. We'll see how it ends up getting used and how it evolves with the community. Uh, so yeah, so you notice different assets have different controls. So here, here's a video, you can set in and out points, I mean, you can set in and out points, soon be able to set pan, zoom, crop type features, uh, over, overlays, um, audio controls, I mean, they're not all implemented, but uh, it knows once you switch to a different asset, like a template, you don't have the same, you can't zoom in on a template, or you, it, it, it knows that the template doesn't have audio, it's just an HTML file, or an HTML resource wiki resource. So it knows different different properties, or if you click on an image that's different from, an image just has a duration, it doesn't have in and out points like a, like a video does. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then of course the, the add media wizard that we saw earlier is integrated into the, integrated into the um, video editor, so once you're in the video editor context, you're, you're hitting that same a uh, collaborative code base that allows people to import uh, libraries for as asset uh, resources. Uh, so it'll, so once somebody adds archive.org to, or once, I mean, once anybody adds a new uh, repository to any, for adding media to pages, it also becomes a new repository for the sequencer and also becomes a new repository for any external wiki that directly links to the JavaScript. <coughs> And it has will have transition effects, normal, normal um, cross like the ones that we saw. We'll be able to enable those, sort of fade from color, cross dissolve. It won't, we won't hit it. We won't obviously that won't be the focus initially, but it'll be left be left open for people that want to dive into infinitum of effects and filters and things. But it won't be the focus for our work. Um, it, it's also it's a. Uh, you can switch between sort of simple uh, iMovie style or Final Cut style if you if you use those type of editors more. You're more familiar with those type of editing environments. It'll support that more or less. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's basically the sequencer overview. Uh, you notice if you go to the and then of course everything will be uh, stored in the hit. All the edits will be stored in the history, so you'll be able to. Uh, you know, revert uh, changes people have made. Uh, we haven't uh, nailed down the uh, visualization of the of the diffs and or the interfaces for uh, reversion and stuff, but that'll be sort of a uh, evolve. I mean, at the present state, at least you have basic basic controls that you have for text, but obviously it'll it'll have to evolve into sort of a more rich representation. If you look at um, we already. If you look on uh, MetaVid presently, we already have sort of a rich, rep uh, rich representation for transcript editing. So when you look at the recent changes here, you're um, you're looking at, you know, it knows that it's a it's a time video segment that you edited, so it represents it as such. So you can preview what the edit was within the recent changes and get a a feel for the accuracy or improvement of the transcript that they did, and if it's a, you know, if it's a bad one, you can just jump right into the improved transcript interface, and those jumps you right back to where that was, so that, you know, it's, a, it's sort of adding tools to quickly jump uh, between the, the various, well, uh, extending the text system for uh, video and letting people jump right into where they need to go to uh, fix things or uh, improve quality of the transcripts. And so that's just, I just show this as an example of um, how we might represent uh, sequence edits. So it's easy to revert and uh, get a quick visual overview of what's changed within a given sequence. Okay, I think there's a few more slides here. Um, ooh, that's not good. Sorry. 
the editor. Okay, we saw that. Demos, okay, thanks for, this is uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Kaltura, open source video solutions. And it's, Medivit is supported by a grant from the Sunlight Foundation. And I think we have an announcement today that uh, Mozilla is sponsoring a 100K development grant for Theora that just got announced right now. <laughs> and it'll be a six month uh, project. It'll include uh, encoder enhancements uh, by Timothy back there. <laughs> and uh, it'll improve the Lubog Pro library. And it'll also do AUG network seeking and improve core library support by uh, Conrad right over there. And he will be giving a talk <laughs> right after mine about some of that stuff. Uh, and now we're open to questions, and there's my contact info.